नमस्ते हु इज श्योर बिंदो एंड देर इज नो सिंपल आंसर इफ आंसर देर कैन बी टू दिस क्वेश्चन इवन इज ह्यूमन पर्सनैलिटी इज सो फैसिनेटिंग सच ए मल्टी फैसिनेट जीनियस एंड टू स्पीक अबाउट हिज डिवाइन पर्सनैलिटी is truly nothing short of diminishing him because what human tongue can utter about someone who had scaled all the heights and depths of the creation and not only he had scaled he could express it in an unparalleled language and uh, with this complete mastery and command so to speak about sharbindo is actually in a sense an exercise which doesn't really take us deep into understanding who he is and yet this exercise is very fruitful because when we speak about sharbindo or listen about sharbindo then we grow in joy that's how it is said in our scriptures that the first steps towards bhakti are shravan manan so when we hear about shorbindo it is itself helps us to grow in some kind of nearness to him but to understand him to know him the mother says is impossible because he is vast as the universe and his teaching is infinite and the only way to know him a little to come closer to him a little is through love and service and giving oneself unreservedly to his work so i suppose even to speak on shorbindo this is the minimum qualification the mother has given us a hint any amount of reading of shorbindo is not enough one has to have love and one has to have service so with this little background and the fact that when biographers tried to write something on shorbindo's life Shubhendu clearly remarked that it is he alone who can give significance to the events in his life. So when a biographer insisted, in fact, there is a biographer whose name was Dhurandar or Dhundur, who wanted to write his biography, and Shubhendu humorously remarked, playing a little pun on the name, that who is this Dhurandar? And then he says, it's okay. Finally, he concedes if he wants to write a biography. and if i have to be murdered in cold print then let it not be by my disciples so you know it's so significant <laughs> so what is this book about shorbindo on himself and the ashram well shorbindo never wrote anything on himself he was never writing he was in fact quite reticent to speak about himself generally he would stay in the background he would hardly speak about himself never like to be in the forefront even when we see the freedom movement and yet how far can the brahma kamal the heavenly lotus hide from the sight of humanity that is how shobindo got known the even now people do not know not only who shobindo is but what shobindo has done it's it's a bit of an irony just as till today people and i can only draw a parallel just as till today people wonder whether krishna is a myth or not and the other day when someone asked me this question i said tell me one single human being who has had such a tremendous influence on art culture dance music philosophy spiritual movements festivity and human relationships even there are you know things like uh, rakhi and holi which are dedicated to krishna i said than shri krishna one person it's not about the number of followers like people often say you know christ has so many followers and uh, you know islam has so many followers that is irrelevant but the number of movements that shri krishna's influence inspired and yet many would say he was a myth maybe after 100 years 500 years 1000 years who knows people would wonder whether there was really one person by the name of shorbindo and yet we see 
that there is so many movements that he has inspired, he has initiated right from India's revolution, participated in the Second World War and opened a path for the future, revealed the truth of the Vedas, the Upanishads, the Gita extensively and guided and continues to guide thousands and thousands of disciples all around the world. So all this uh, about Sri and um, so, but he never wrote anything about himself. He used to remain in the background. So this book is actually a compilation of letters that he wrote to different disciples who asked him specific questions. Some of them, them were when somebody wrote on Sri and wanted him to take a look whether it's correct or not, and Sri made corrections. But frankly, I have not understood the logic behind the arrangement of this volume because this volume in a certain sense is supposed to be a continuation or a descent from the volume in Sri Aurobindo Birth Centenary Library, that is 1972 volume, uh, series of volumes, where there was a volume called Sri Aurobindo and himself. A marvelous book. If you read it from beginning to end, you don't feel like leaving it. And besides it awakened in us a deep respect, admiration, love, everything for Sri Aurobindo. But for some reason, and um, of course I can give reasons, but that's really not relevant. Maybe the way it has been arranged with the mental consciousness of someone, whereas that book was a spontaneous flowing out of someone who had genuine love and admiration for Sri Aurobindo under the guidance of the mother, that one doesn't feel so well connected with this uh, volume as it was with the sim same volume in SABCL. The name has been slightly changed, so that was only Sri Aurobindo on himself. This is Sri Aurobindo on himself and the ashram. A lot of new letters have been brought in, some context have been brought in, some are half is here, half is in autobiographical note. Some letters are partly here, partly in letters on yoga. So it doesn't really, um, I mean, the arrangement seems at times very illogical and uh, uh, very difficult. It's like scattered. Somebody has written it in a scattered state of consciousness, probably for academic purposes. So that apart, yet there are plenty of letters of Sri and Sri letters are always beautiful to read, always uplifting. And uh, when we have gone through the volume, we do have a kind of a comprehensive view of uh, all that Sri Aurobindo has spoken about himself. So, uh, this book has number of parts. There are five parts at least in this particular volume. And I'll just read out some of these parts. For instance, there is the first part which is primarily about remarks on his life and works and on his contemporaries and contemporary events. It's a very big blanket uh, chapter. So it becomes very uh, mixed up. So remarks on his life, events in his outer life. And then his works and on his contemporaries and contemporary events. So, contemporaries and contemporary events that were happening. So, we will have a whole set of things here. And while it's okay, they have been brought in under one umbrella. As I said, there is a interlacing of many things together. And part two is his sadhana or practice of yoga, which is seen from... So, this is in context of certain specific disciples. Whereas, letters on yoga is also about sadhana, but they are more general letters. And here they have given the questionnaires question also. So to that extent it is a good thing. And part three is the leader and the guide. So as the guru, the avatar, help in difficulties, part four, the practice of yoga in the ashram and outside. And part five is mantra and messages. So this is what this volume consists of. And let me now come straight to some of the selections which I have made to share and as I said for the joy of it. So people have an image of Sri Aurobindo and that image is normally based on the Darshan Day photograph or uh, the image which is the 1920 photograph or a little before where he looks uh, like an ascetic. There is a photograph of 19, before 1920 actually, where he looks more like an ascetic. The mother has remarked about that. A lot of people like it because it reminds them of Christ who has sacrificed himself at the you know cross 
But that's not uh, what Shurabindo is. It doesn't far from it, far from capturing its totality. Then we have a 1920 photograph, which is sparkling and, you know, one can feel the sense of infinity in his eyes, the power in his gaze. And then a long period in which there is no photograph and there is 1950 when we have the royal majestic photograph where he looks like his gaze is commanding the whole universe. So based on these photographs and the high uplifting writings, especially the life divine. So it looks like here is somebody who is sitting on some Himalayan grandeur and instantly the sense is that we cannot approach him. He is too high, too majestic, too much above anything in the world. How can we approach him? And we have Shubindo's uh, own letters which is defying this notion. For instance, he says in one of his letters, O oh, rubbish, this is a letter to Dilip Kumar Roy. I am austere and grand. People had this idea. And even now people start following, imitating Shurabindo. They start wearing a dhoti, start shutting them inside a room. Don't meet, don't look up. As if Shurabindo is that. And as if by imitating, even if he was that, as if by imitating we can arrive at, we, we forget that Shurabindo led a full life, both mother and Shurabindo. And the sacrifice, the wrestle, the battle was all going on inside. He was not telling to the world what is going on inside. He was married, he was into politics, he did a job, he taught, he studied and everything he did with an excellence. And yet his life had an inner dimension, even outward a battle because we see that how the British government and even as a child he says that living in uh, near poverty in England because there was a whole period when he had just enough amount of money to take uh, one sausage in the morning and a cup of tea. That's all. And it's not that he was practicing any fasting. It's simply because there was no money. And with one coat he had to go through the entire period in England. So this was the aspect of his life as a battle. Imagine somebody comes at Apollo Bandar after returning, foreign return. So what do you expect? One people with full mala and everything, you know. And um, of course, after the initial Shuddhi Karan has used to be there in the ancient times, if you came from the West, it was understood that your consciousness has got corrupted. So you have to take a bath, a ritual. Uh, and I do understand that, you know, why people would have thought so. And then after that, you can go in. Now, of course, they do band baj Baja Bharat and also, in addition, parents, they would be so happy. Now here is Shurvindu landing on Apollo Bandar and he is greeted by none else but Mother India. And what does she put? A garland of calm. A calm descended upon me. That's how Shurvindu describes. A vast calm. She greets him. And then what about parents? Mother had lost her head. Father died just two days before Shurabindu has come because he got a wrong telegram that, you know, the ship has sunk. So we can imagine what would have been his state. And then after coming here again, living in Baroda, though he is married, he has stayed away. He hardly had any married life and uh, all kinds of food, whatever the cook made, he had to eat it. And then, of course, we know the revolutionary movement wherein the jail and in the jail the sword hanging over his neck and then when he comes out he goes to Pondicherry where again we see that with very little money he is continuing the work and that work is not at all an ordinary uh, I mean rather even to say it extraordinary is uh, to belittle it that is the kind of work that Sri continued to do so all this he experienced in his life and People had this idea that he is austere and grand, grim and stern. And then with this characteristic humor he says, I am austere and grand, grim and stern, every blasted thing that I never was. I groan in an un-Aurobindonian despair when I hear such things. He says, this is the image you people have made, made about me. What has happened to the common sense of all of you people? In order to reach the over mind, it is not at all necessary to take leave of this simple but useful quality. 
which is common sense. Common sense, by the way, is not logic, which is the least common sense-like thing in the world. Look at the humor he's being in. <laughs> With logic, you can prove anything. Actually, you can literally prove, and I have heard people proving, using logic, that how what is written in a holy book is right, that the sun rises and sets in the same place. <laughs> That's you can prove it because actually technically yes. Technically if I look at with my gross vision, sun rises uh, in Pondicherry, it sets also in Pondicherry. So you can literally say it is sunset. So you are technically, you can say that you are correct. So logic can prove anything. So he says the least commonsensical like thing. It is simply look at looking at things as they are without inflation or deflation, not imagining wild imaginations or for that matter, despairing, I know not why, despairs. And then he corrects this, see, after remarking about him, he corrects this notion that he was somebody who never smiled in this way. The divine may be difficult, but his difficulties can be overcome if one keeps at him. Even my smilelessness was overcome, which Nevinson had remarked with horror more than 20 years before. Because he saw he was, he was absorbed in his inner meditation. So when he saw him in the court, he remarked that he is a man who never smiles. It had nothing to do with grimness or sternness. He was so self-absorbed in that state of blissful experience of Vasudev everywhere. And therefore, he had concluded, Nevinson, the most dangerous man in India, Aurobindo Ghosh, the man who never smiles. And Sri says, he ought to have added, but who always jokes. Sri had a wonderful sense of humor. But he did not know that, as I was very solemn with him. Or perhaps I had not developed sufficiently on that side then. Anyhow, if you could overcome that, you are bound to overcome all the other difficulties also. And then he finally says, The mistake was an old obstinate suggestion returning so as to bring about the old reactions which have to be got over. It is your old error of the greatness and grimness of God. So we are instilled, God is great and is grim, he is serious. He doesn't like music, he doesn't like art. He doesn't like sculpture. He doesn't like architecture. All that he wants is quietly pray for him. Seriously. This is how you have to pray. You better pray. And if you commit a mistake, blasphemy against him. He will punish you, roast you in hell. This is the notion. And from that, we also have developed. This is not how Sanatana Dharma was. Shiva is so loving even though he is austere and grand literally. And Krishna is so playful and joking. I mean... I can't imagine conception of a God like Krishna. And yet, somewhere we drew that other notion and it got superimposed upon our mind. So he says that this is what brings back the wrong ideas and the gloom. Like people say, mother gets angry, how would Sri Aurobindo look at it? All these are our own notions. Not uh, All this talk about grimness and sternness is sheer rot. Now look at now Sri Aurobindo. He has used the word rot. It's not a bad word. It's a good word. I mean, people use it. But look at Sri gentlemanliness. Mother said that he is a thorough gentleman. He said, he says, all this is sheer rot. You will excuse me for the expression, but there is no other that is adequate. So he used the word rot and he says, I have, I'm sorry I have to use this expression <laughs> because there is nothing else which is, uh, you know, proper. So this is how he says, he says people who don't smile are like Stalin and Mussolini who are grim and earnest. Uh, in fact, at one place he says in one of his aphorism, the, a God who never smiles could not have created this wonderful world, amusing world. And then of course, uh, there are letters which uh, clarify a lot of doubts. For example, people often use this uh, spiritual, he has used the word supramental. But basically, he has just only qualified spiritual. It is the same thing, spiritual. But he has used the word supramental, like somebody else may use some other word. And Sri reminds us in a letter, if spiritual and supramental were the same thing, 
look how he is you know with that com- appealing to our even common sense then all the sages and devotees and yogis and sadhaks throughout the ages would have been supramental beings and all i have written about the super mind would be so much superfluous rubbish anybody who had spiritual experiences would then be a supramental being the ashram would be chock full of supramental beings and every other ashram in india also so there are two dif- distinct uh, terms naturally and shobindo is a jadugar of everything and he is he is a jadugar of words also so his words are very precise i have not seen one uh, person using words with such precision and with such finish even the most common place word by a usage he would change it or you know it it becomes so sublime as i said one of them being uh, loiters in nature's instrument loiters secret god and many such words uh, even in savitri so he explains and that we can uh, omit for now because there are other places where he has explained this at great length then people would ask that you know uh, what is the difference between this yoga and others even now people say that you know it is the same thing like yoga of the gita they even bring out passages from yoga of the gita and draw a comparison now what they forget is that there are many commonalities if if you have, if you compare even god with a human being when god assumes a human form so you will say what is the difference both have two eyes one nose one mouth two ears two legs two hands that's how one will describe but the difference is not in this there is a world of difference which we are completely ignoring so when we compare the gita and shirvindo's yoga the vedas and shirvindo the upanishad and shirvindo there are things that we miss out there are many common things there will be common things like conquest of desire mastery over the ego annulling the ego equanimity they are all common things to any true spiritual practice but there are differences which we need to uh, reckon with so here is a letter where he says it is new as compared with the old yogas one because it aims not at a departure out of world and life into a heaven or a nirvana but at a change of life and existence so first thing is goal is different so very often when people uh, i have had this situation when, when they say that well uh, what is written in the upanishads what is written in the gita same thing is in shurvindo so i ask this one simple question and they quote this yogi that baba now everybody is right it's not about any of these things so i ask them that what is the product that finally they are giving a very business like uh, attitude i know but that's the only thing which goes home moksha yes but moksha is something i don't want what do you want i said that what i want is what shurvindo is giving now it's a fact through all the spiritual history so far we keep hearing about salvation in the beyond a secure place in heaven or moksha these are the three basic uh, aims which have been put forward as the highest but for sure when the moksha is a step and not the conclusion of the journey so he says that because it aims not at a departure out of world and life into heaven or a nirvana but at a change of life and existence not as something subordinate or incidental but as a distinct and central object so he says it is not just that there should, would be some change because some change takes place in all yogas all yogis every person who is aspiring for spiritual life most of them will develop some kind of an inner change this is bound to happen some kind of peacefulness quietude the reactions but that is not transformation shubhendu clarifies that two because the object sought after is not an individual achievement of divine realization for the sake of the individual but something to be gained for the earth consciousness so this also here we see that in all yogas the aim ultimately is individual and if at all you you include the society like there are movements which speak about jan seva nar seva is narayan seva but what do they do really they either have their teaching schools where they ultimately teach vedanta and the path to moksha or else they have free hospitals free schools etc etc but that is not the goal it the goal here is a collective transformation of mankind so that 
there can be a divine life established upon earth. What is meant is very simple. It's not about opening a free hospital, but giving man, empowering man to learn to heal from within. And in a radical way, by that ultimate power, the yogic force, how it can make us write, how it can make us speak, how it can make us, uh, I, how it can be activated in every sphere of human life, a change of the way we look at human relationships. And now this aspect is slowly coming in. But the goal which has been presented is individual moksha in traditional paths. And three, because a method has been preconized for achieving this purpose which is as total and integral as the aim set before it. So meaning thereby that the method is not just meditation, not just bhakti, not just karma yoga. It is all these things but something else, something more. A whole, it's a package, comprehensive package which includes every aspect of human existence. And then Sri says, if I had... Um, I have not found this method as a whole or anything like it proposed or realized in the old yogas. If I had, I should not have wasted my time in hewing out paths and in 30 years of search and inner creation when I could have hastened home safely to my goal in an easy canter over paths already blazed out, laid down, perfectly mapped, macadamized, made secure in public. So very clearly, Shubhinda says that there are new elements. Again, what are those new elements? Everything is not here. Here only is saying, goal is different. It's not individual but collective. At the same time, there is a method which is different, which he describes over the other volumes. Now there are some interesting remarks that Shubhinda gave about many world personalities. And one of them, I thought I'll take out, because we often use in the same breath, is about... Gandhi. Okay? So, let's hold our breath. <laughs> Most of the spiritual leaders of that time, yogis, did not have a very kindly uh, observation about Gandhi. Now it's different that we are, many things are coming to light. And we have used him just like the church has used Christ, canonized him, worship him to get money and influence. Christ is Christ. But here, Gandhi is not even very far from that. Though he is a Christian by his temperament. And yet his name is used on the money, that note and everywhere else to get votes. Now that apart. But what about Gandhi, Shurabindu's view? Actually, he wanted to come and have Shurabindu's darshan. So, Shurabindu refused. He gave some reason. And then... Somebody insisted that maybe he will uh, he will change by discovering that there is something beyond. And Shubhinder said, no, this is not likely to happen. And when Vinova Bhave had come and... Vinova Bhave had a very interesting opening. When Gandhiji wrote to him about his experiments with truth, I don't want to qualify it further. So he said, I don't agree with all this, your experiments about brahmacharya and experiments with truth, but I don't want to discuss it further and I want to keep silent on the subject. So that Binova Bhavi, when he had come, mother was very happy meeting him, gave some nice that you are doing a good work, Bhudan, and you continue doing it. And then he asked for uh, Shurabindo's uh, life, the life divine signed by Shurabindo for Gandhiji. Shurabindo smiled and said, uh, I don't think he will read it. But if you are asking, I am giving it to you. He gave it. And when he gave to Gandhiji, he said, uh, I don't think I will read or understand it. And he passed it to somebody else. <laughs> so why? why? What was the problem? Because, you know, uh, we hear so much. But there is another side which we need to see. Now, this is from the divine vision point of view. As for Gandhi, why should you suppose that I am so tender for the faith of the Mahatma? I do not call it faith at all, but a rigid mental belief. And what he terms soul force is only a strong vital will which has taken a religious turn. What a threadbare analysis. That, of course, can be a tremendous force for action. But unfortunately, Gandhi spoils it by his ambition to be a man of reason, while in fact he has no reason in him at all. Never was reasonable at any moment in his life and, I suppose, never will be. 
and now when we look back at noah khali and his responses saying that no 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 you people should not even if they come marry your women and even in fact at one point he goes on to say if the muslims kill all the hindus and take over the land you should allow it you will usher a new creation that way now look at him he says never was reasonable anybody with a little common sense can understand it is one of the most unreasonable statement by any standard <laughs> that one can ever hear and yet we worship him do the full mala and all i think time has come to regard that well we don't accept him as the father of the nation whatever it be and as i as i keep saying father of the nation is rama krishna shurbindu and if you go far back time the rishi is so who had the vision of bharat mata so he he says never will be what he has in its place is a remarkable type of unintentionally sophistic sophistic logic not sophisticated so Sof, he is a sophist who <laughs> who almost like a, you know bear ascetic and trying to um, goat milk and charkha and sleep on the floor that kind of logic well what this reason this amaz- amazingly precisely unreliable logic brings about is that nobody is ever sure and i don't think he is himself really sure what he will do next he has not only two minds but three or four minds and all depends on which will turn up top most at a particular moment and how it will combine with the others and we know how much india has suffered and continues to suffer and yet this is a paradox that people at whose hands we have suffered we eulogize them and put them on a pedestal so why did the british leave well it was the conditions had become such gandhi or no gandhi they would have gone there was no nothing left for them this country was no more they had looted what they could loot it had become unlivable with all the revolt and all around people were unhappy there was famine people had they had plundered everything and after second world war they they had neither the means nor the resources to manage india and what they did along with gandhi to india uh, just as an aside just compare the map of india post mahabharat it is all there on the internet the map of india during moguls and the map of india post the british raj and you will see what they have done nothing else required so this is uh, he is very clear about uh, there would be no harm in that on the contrary there might be an advantage uh, if there were a central light somewhere choosing for him and shaping the decision to the need of the action he thinks there is and calls it god but it has always seemed to me that it is his own mind that decides and most of the time decides wrongly so this you know voice of god all this i am hearing one should be so wary of that so he says that he decides with his mind and calls it the voice of god he thinks there is and calls it god anyhow i cannot imagine lenin or mustafa kamal not knowing their own minds or acting in this way even their strategic retreats were steps towards an end clearly convinced conceived and executed now you see whose name is bringing together lenin and mustafa kamal they nothing else but asuric beings and shubindu is not saying anything directly he says at least they have a clear mind this shubindu's beautiful way of saying but at the end he does say that well but whatever it be it is all mind and action and vital force in gandhi so why should he be taken as an example of the defeat of the divine or of a spiritual power i quite allow that there has been something behind gandhi greater than himself and you can call it the divine or a cosmic force which has used him but then there is that behind everybody who is used as an instrument for world ends behind Kam- kamal and lenin also <laughs> so that is not germane to the matter that's why when we see that uh, later message when gandhi has left the body was killed and shubindu gave a message the light that led india to freedom continues to lead so people took it as if he is saying very highly of gandhi he was revealing a very uh, beautiful truth that well there is a light that led and it used gandhi as an instrument and he'll continue to lead india but it was done in such a sophisticated way and there are people you know who have quoted that piece circulate that see 
this how just like people keep quoting uh, the mother invited nehru and she had very high opinion of nehru now if you read through you will see how she looked at the whole thing so here he has uh, made it very clear and then person as it's govind bhai patel mostly yesterday i thought how nice it would be if gandhi ji came here for the truth which he is seeking at times he hears some voice he says and shubhendu's reply i don't think he would accept the truth that is here his mind is too rigid for it this is a very vast many sided plastic truth well and it goes on there are number of letters on and he says the view taken by the mahatma in these matters caste and all that is christian rather than hindu for the christian self abasement humility the acceptance of a low status to serve humanity or the divine are things which are highly spiritual and the noblest privilege of the soul you know often there is that you know i am the biggest sinner it is regarded as a great quality but in india we don't say that we say aam brahmasmi it sound very egoistic but that is the deepest truth sin belongs to as mother has said to the old world it doesn't belong to yoga we have to remind ourselves of the deepest truth yes we may roll in the mud but that's not what we are so he he says that well he is more of uh, uh, a christian by temperament and perhaps that's why the british could gel with him and he could understand them they could understand him. and he it suited their purpose to put him as the leader and this they do always whether it be osama bin laden now in a different context it's a very old uh, way of uh, the western world that it uh, puts leaders who will serve their purposes they will be his masters voice at the same time they will allow them to do the agitation and whatever it is knowing this is less harmful than let's say someone else okay and of gandhi ji they are remarks on many leaders in this in the same vein uh, then about the second world war where shobindu intervened there is a very interesting letter you have said that you have begun to doubt whether it was the mother's war shobindu is saying you have said to a disciple and ask me to make you feel again that it is i affirm again to you see how well shobindu was saying this was a time when gadi and ink did not look at it like that britishers are india's enemy and they are germany is britain's enemy to shatru ka shatru mitra on that principle of panchatantra subhas bos operated and shubhendu Shub said it is very dangerous gandhi ji and all said if hitler comes let him come and occupy but we will not give our hearts to him hitler would have found no better <laughs> place than to enter like this and they did not support the british because they thought that britishers are our enemy but at this point of time a whole world civilization was at stake it was not about british at all and so when shubhendu contributed to the war fund many people didn't understand why he is doing so so here he gives the reason that i affirm again to you most strongly that this is the mother's war you should not think it think of it as a fight for certain nations against others or even for india it is a struggle for an ideal that has to establish itself on earth in the life of humanity for a truth that has yet to realize itself fully and against a darkness and falsehood that are trying to overwhelm the earth and mankind in the immediate future it is the forces behind the battle that have to be seen and not this or that superficial circumstance it is no use concentrating on the defects or mistakes of nations all have defects and commit serious mistakes but what matters is on what side they have ranged themselves in the struggle it is a struggle for the liberty of mankind to develop for conditions in which men have freedom and room to think and act according to the light in them and grow in the truth grow in the spirit there cannot be the slightest doubt that if one side wins there will be an end of all such freedom and hope of light and truth and the work that has to be done will be subjected to conditions which would make it humanly impossible and that what explains when many many of us people speak about islam why because if it were to rule the world it will be by a monotone by a single harsh cruel logic or illogic call it whatever 
there will be no freedom anymore and all this kind of thinking no no everything is good everything is born hami people should be so careful it is in fact worse than even the fascism that hitler could bring out only thing is it has been stopped and stemmed at this point of time and it just that in our thought and feeling we must know that it is a dangerous doctrine and philosophy and this is nothing against the founder and the original philosophy that's really irrelevant but about how it is understood and practiced today and he accepts what i have said is not that the allies have never done wrong things but that they stand on the side of the evolutionary forces i have not said that at random but on what to me are clear grounds of fact so he has you know um, he wrote about the uh, poem on hitler the dwarf napoleon because hitler was proclaiming himself that just as napoleon represented france he represents germany and europe he was literally using that just as he was using the word arya he was using the word superman and therefore shubindo writes the poem hitler the dwarf napoleon who has nothing of the napoleon in him and he says napoleon for all his defects was at least courageous he was a man who fought in the front rank but what hitler is full of deceit receiving the voice of god again but all his commands were by the Uh, asura called as the lord of all sort or the lord of nations and how the mother it's a whole chapter i think uh, george von rickheim has written uh, very beautifully in a whole book collecting all the documents i think uh, god of hitler or something like that the name of the book is so it's a fascinating chapter just like the mahabharata at a much more mega scale it is a mahabharata of mahabharata that shurvindo fought from his room just as Shri Krishna sitting on the chariot was fighting the Mahabharata in those times. So here we see another avataric aspect of Shri Aurobindo. Uh, on one side, when Shri Krishna says, "Yada yada hi dharma se glani bhavati Bharata, abhyutthana ma dharma se tadat manusha jame ham," and then he gives that what is this abhyutthana ma dharma se to restore the dharma that we see in his writings through the Arya. Dharma is what would align us to the truth of creation, to the true law. and he does it through his countless writings so that is one part but paritrana ay sadhunam vinashay cha duskritam this we see in the great second world war and of course his fight against the british where all the good doers are released they are shown a path a new path and all that is the forces of downward gravitation which were represented during the time by hitler stalin mussolini and something of them continue to persist till today and they are taking a bro beating one by one and then finally he says the divine takes men as they are and uses them as his instruments even if they are not flawless in character so the divine doesn't uh, act according to uh, everybody must be good no he can use instrument i mean uh, arjun had his own defects in nature and this was a diff- uh, discussion going on in once in nalnida's room yes he had his side uh, but yet he was the person meant to become the hero the nar of the nar narayan so the divine doesn't look at these things even if they are not flawless in character without stain or sin or fault exemplary in virtue or angelic holy and pure perhaps it's as good as saying that then nobody will be ever an instrument of the divine if they are of good will at one place the mother even says what will god do with innocent angels a converted asura is much more useful for god's work because he has that energy titanic energy grandiosity he can accommodate the grandiosity of god provided he is converted he is surrendered but an innocent angel is a nice very nice sweet but he has a little place like a butterfly <laughs> so it's so he says if they are of good will if to use the biblical phrase they are on the lord side that is enough for the work to be done even if i knew that the allies i am speaking of the big nations america britain china would misuse their victory or bungle the peace or partially at least spoil the opportunities open to the human world by that victory i would still put my force behind them and it's quite likely that behind these nations uh, shubindo's force has gone america uh, uk france and china all these nations which fought together and probably now of course it has a term and things are waning slowly 
And then there are wonderful letters. One of them is, of course, uh, what do you call meditation? This, in this yoga, you don't find about meditation, but somebody has asked him that he used to meditate for hours. So people think meditation means closing the eyes and trying to meditate. So Shivinda says, what do you call meditation? Shutting the eyes and concentrating? It is only one method for calling down the true consciousness. To join with the true consciousness or feel its descent is the only thing important. And if it comes without the orthodox method, as it always did with me, so much the better. Meditation is only a means or device. The true movement is when even walking, working or speaking, one is still in sadhana. And that's why Shubhinda made no distinction between this worldliness and other worldliness. He says, all the time I was engaged in outer activity, even ghor karma, but at the same time I, I was having other worldly experiences. So both of them came together, went together, hand in hand, one enriching and completing the other. So he says, for me, all is Brahman and I find the divine everywhere. Everyone has the right to throw away this worldliness and choose other worldliness only. And if he finds peace by that choice, he is greatly blessed. I personally have not found it necessary to do this in order to have peace. In my yoga also, I found myself moved to include both worlds in my purview, the spiritual and the material, and to try to establish the divine consciousness and the divine power in men's hearts and in earthly life, not for personal salvation only, but for a life divine here. So this is how Shubhindo looks at it. And there are some personal anecdotes. Nowadays, this thing is going on. Shobindo, Swami Vivekananda, he showed him the way and, you know, then people have a tendency to take it to any length. Now, in Shobindo's own words, his letter, somebody has asked him, I was wondering if you had seen or met Vivekananda somewhere. Shobindo's letter, very specific. No, not in the body. My contact with him was in the jail. When he was speaking with me for about 15 days, giving me the first insight into the intuition plane as the first opening to supermind. That's what is meant by he showed him the way to the intuition plane from where you can glimpse the supermind. Very clearly. There are people who say that he showed the way to supermind and he showed him the path, gave him the path, everything. So... <laughs> And 15 days on a specific subject. Later on, Shravindu even further clarified that the, on one of the letters of Niruddha, I don't know where, it must be somewhere among the volumes, but it's not here. So he says that it was the mental personality of Swami Vivekananda. It was not Vivekananda as such. And of course, he speaks about when mother has come and what it meant. One small little letter with which we can stop. We will do it in two parts because it has many other aspects. It is not clear what your Guru meant by my sitting on the path. Somebody must have said, Sri Aurobindo is, is sitting on the path, was sitting on the path. People make all kinds of remarks. And somebody would have asked Sri Aurobindo, imagine disciples also great people. Huh? He is saying you are sitting on the path. And Shurvindo is not getting annoyed. <laughs> Somebody else. Achha, this is how you think about your guru and you allow. And look at how Shurvindo writes. What a precision. What a sincerity. That is something so tremendous about Shurvindo. It is not clear what your guru meant by my sitting on the path. Look what he says next. That could have been true of the period between 1915 and 1920 when I was writing the Arya. He says, yes, there was a time when I was sitting on the path. What was that period when I was writing the Arya? <laughs> Just imagine. But look what he writes then further. But the sadhana and the work were waiting for the mother's coming. I mean, I haven't heard something more beautiful, sweet, powerful, revealing as this one. But the sadhana, the sadhana and the work were waiting for the mother's coming. Namaste. Namaste.